I can only thank God that he appeared. You know, the last one I did with him, which was three or four days ago in Delhi, he was only 45 minutes late. And the audience <laughs> almost walked out. So, um, you know, thank, you should thank your lucky stars that he arrived um, just in time. Um, uh, uh, Tamina Durrani going on half an hour late to thank for that. <laughs> well, well let, me, let, let me just say, um, uh, about 25 years ago, which seems an awful long time, um, I got a phone call from London from this guy who sort of panic-stricken said to me, I've been, I've been told to write a story on Pakistan and I have no idea anything about the politics of Pakistan. Can you possibly brief me? So I, I said, who, who, you know, who the hell are you? And I, my language was <laughs> slightly more, you know, effusive than that. And he said, I'm, I'm William Dalrymple. And I, of course I said, yes, I was, because I had just read his first book, which was this travelogue called In Xanadu, which was, uh, a, in, in my opinion, there were, there were numerous books written about the Afghan war, which, as many of you know, I followed very closely and continue to do so. But, but out of all the travel books that were written on Afghanistan of the, the first war with the Soviet Union, Willie's was by far um, the most moving and the best. So, of course, since then, we've been very good friends. And um, it's, been, you know, it's been wonderful to see him progress through... Um, you know, all the travel books, the, the books in the, about the Middle East, the, the Mughal histories, um, and now he seems to be coming down now to the, you know, 1830s, 1840s, not to speak of the um, incredible book about, the, about uh, Hinduism uh, just before this. So uh, this is a man with an enormous range, which is both historical and uh, novelistic and um, this book, I can tell you, which I've read, reads like a thriller. You will not be able to put it, put it down, even though it's like all good predictable thrillers, you know the outcome, but you will really want to read this. So, Willie, uh, we, so this evening, we're gonna, he's going to give you a presentation of the book, um, and then we're going to sit down and have a conversation. Willie, it's all yours. Thank Thanks you. for that. I should, thank you very much. I should just say thank you to Ahmed. I have been using Ahmed as a sort of oral source for every single story I've written about Pakistan <laughs> uh, for about 30 years now and uh, ripping him off unpaid. Uh, the only, thing I, only useful thing I ever did with him was to help him find a publisher for a little book called Taliban, uh, which, <laughs> which um, went on to sell how many co million copies? Quite a few. Uh, six million or something, anyway. I, like my, my entire output for 100 years ten times over, but anyway, it, uh, it's good to do you a favor in return. So, what I'm going to talk about today is the greatest imperial catastrophe ever to be suffered by the British Empire. It was an extraordinary tale of, in a nutshell, an incredibly foolish attempt to attack Afghanistan by the British Raj. 18,000 men marched in. One man on the retreat made it out to Jalalabad. The rest of the army was completely destroyed, down to the last man. And this took place at the high point of British power in, in the entire history of Britain. Traditionally, British share of GDP of the world is about seven, eight percent in the Middle, in the Middle Ages. It grew to 50 percent nearly by the 1840s and it's been in decline ever since, first with the rise of Germany, then with the rise of America. But this defeat, this complete destruction of an entire army down to just one man surviving, took place at a time when Britain was more powerful than it's ever been before or would ever be again. So the story opens. I'd like you to imagine yourselves out on the step between Meshed and Herat, broken bandit country disputed between these two, between uh, Qajar Persia on one hand and the last remaining bastion of, of Durrani rule, of, of, of uh, Sadduzai rule, uh, which was Herat. In the hot night of the summer of 1837, and a young, British artillery, oh sorry, a young British intelligence officer is trying to get to the Shah's camp near Meshed. But he's been on his horse for two days and a night. 
And because there's a war about to break out, all the post horses and the caravanserais have been taken, and he can't change his mount. So he's exhausted, the horse is exhausted, it's a hot night, and drooping off his saddle, he loses his way. Now, what is a British intelligence officer and an artillery officer doing in Persia in 1837? The answer is that for the, there is a growing imperial competition between the two great land empires of the period. On one hand, imperial Russia, which has been moving southwards and is now about to absorb the independent Khanates and Emirates of Samarkand, Bukhara, Kiva, and so on. And coming from the opposite direction, coming out of Calcutta and working its way northwards and westwards, the East India Company. The East India Company is something we take for granted in history, but an extraordinary organization. It is a company. It has a board, it has a boardroom, it has shareholders, it ha publishes accounts, it has shares that go up and down in value, but it also has the largest standing army in Asia. And by the 1830s, is one of the most aggressive imperial forces, while remaining, weirdly, a company that publishes accounts and has meetings and does all that kind of stuff. Think today, if there was to be equivalent today, Microsoft with fighter jets or Pepsi Cola with submarines. Uh, you know, this would be the. And it's no more extraordinary than that. It, it is an extraordinary thing. So this company. One governor general, Lord Wellesley, conquers more of India than Napoleon conquers of, Asia, uh, of Europe. So this is an aggressive, powerful company sweeping north and westwards, the Russians coming down, and it's clear to anyone in a club in London or sitting in a war room of St. Petersburg that these two great empires are going to bang into each other and meet, and they're clearly going to meet in the unmapped territory of the Hindu Kush, somewhere up there in that territory that's now Afghanistan. But there is no map at this point. No one really knows in Europe what's there. There's no proper cartography of this area. Few travelers' accounts is all they have to go on. And the British decide to prop up the Persians who've been attacked over and over again by the Russians. And the Rawlinson, the young, the young intelligence officer, is sent in 1835 to help the Persians learn better artillery techniques so they can defeat the Russians in armies. So this British mission, it's again, it's very resonant to the sort of thing we see today of, uh, of, of uh, the West sending in uh, advisors to, to teach people to, to do puppet armies. It's something that we see a lot in the current war. But uh, in 1837, Rawlinson has been there training up the Persians. And on this night, exhausted, he loses the road. And he disappears off into the desert. And he realizes, he wakes up half asleep on his saddle and realizes he's completely lost. He doesn't know where he is. He's somewhere between these. There's two armies about to attack each other. It's anyway bandit territory. It's not the kind of place you want to get lost at night. And he is screwed. <laughs> and then dawn begins to break. First light hits the top of the Kohi Shah Jahan mountains. And he can see coming towards him a cloud of dust. And the cloud of dust resolves itself into a large body of cavalry coming towards him. So he does what anyone would do. He's just got one groom with him. He backs off down a little side valley. And as the horsemen draw nearer, he expects there are Afghans or Persians or opium smugglers or brigands. They're none of those. It is Imperial Russian Cossack cavalry. And this man has happened to chance upon, by getting lost, it is the great intelligence scoop of his generation. It is what the CIA were looking for in Iraq. It was the yellow cake or the weapons of mass destruction. It is the piece of evidence which will allow, over the following 18 months, a group of right-wing, ideologically driven hawks to choose a war they don't need to fight. Because the sighting of Russians going into Afghanistan is the evidence that the warmongering party in Calcutta and London need to say that the Russians are going to take over Afghanistan, we've got to get there first. We've got to send an army into the field. And just look at the map, they say. If only we could take Afghanistan, if only we could, uh, we could have this territory, then the whole central of Asia will be ours. We can move from Persia to China, we can control the routes from Samarkand to Delhi, uh, we can look down on Lahore, which at this point is at the height of Ranjit Singh's empire with the Khalsa. And then the British realize that they have a useful asset. Shah Shuja ul Mulk, can we have the lights down slightly? Shah Shuja ul Mulk, the grandson of Ahmed Shah Durrani, 
has been kicked out of Afghanistan, has lost the last remnants of, of, the, of the, uh, Amit Shah Durrani's empire at the age of only 25. And the British, realizing that he could be a potentially a useful asset, have kept him on in Ludhiana, the nearest border post to Ranjit Singh's uh, Sikh Punjab, and allow him to have his court and allow all this. 1837, he suddenly gets a visit and says, we're going to put you back on the throne. Now, this is not at all necessary for the British, because this is the, the, the Russian officer, Vikovich, who Rawlinson cites going into, sees going into Afghanistan at the head of this Russian cavalry. This is the man who runs Afghanistan at this point. This is Amir, uh, Amir Dost Mohammed sitting in the middle. And on the ground in Kabul, the British have another young intelligence agent uh, called Alexander Burns, Bukhara Burns. And Burns is sending back all these messages to Kalkata saying, you don't need to do regime change. A little bit of negotiation with Dost Mohammed, and he will become a British ally. There's no need to take this guy, Shah Shuja, out of retirement to send an army. It's completely unnecessary. But because this guy is glamorous, oversexed, has published several bestsellers, uh, he's irritated all his superiors. It's a, case, a classic case of departmental jealousy. The old men don't want to be told what to do by the glamorous young rising star. And Burns' message is ignored. And by Ranjit Singh, uh, initially this is meant to be a Sikh operation for British interests. The British think that they can get the Sikhs to fight their war for them. So McNaughton, the main British negotiator, arrives here in Lahore and negotiates with Ranjit Singh, saying, will you send your army into the Punjab to effect regime change for us? Ranjit Singh, brilliant strat uh, uh, tactician and strategist. Brilliant negotiator. At the end of six-week negotiations, it's not a Sikh war in British interests. It becomes a British war in Sikh interests. Uh, and British are going to do Rajit Singh's work for them. And, and it's going to be a British army that goes into the passes and gets rid of Dost Mohammed, who is Ranjit Singh's great enemy. So this extraordinary... And, and there's a lot of familiar rhetoric, which we'll come back to um, when Ahmed and I talk about the parallels with the present and, and how uh, this affects um, the current Afghanistan. But the kind of rhetoric that you're getting at this point sounds very familiar to all of us. Here's the British ambassador in Tehran in 1837, just before the war. We should declare that he who is not with us is against us. <laughs> uh, ever heard that before? We must secure Afghanistan. Can you remember all that stuff in the papers about whether it was the occupying forces duty to bring liberation to women, introduce Western democracy, introduce new forms of justice, or do you just pragmatically occupy a country? Well, this whole thing goes on again. Um, here is the British chief spy master, Sir Claude Wade. There is nothing more to be dreaded or guarded against, I think, than the overweening confidence with which we are too often accustomed to regard the excellence of our own institutions and the anxiety we display in introducing them in new and untried soils. Such interference will always lead to acrimonious disputes, if not a violent reaction. In other words, we don't do regime, we don't do nation building. Uh, it's the kind of Rumsfeld argument. Um, so, 1837, the army assembles in Ferozpur in the Punjab. And this is Victorian Britain at its most pompous and magnificent. 14,000 East India Company sepoys and 6,000 irregulars. The largest field force the East India Company will put to the field since the fall of Tipu Sultan in Seringapatam in 1799. 21,000 troops in all, uh, 38,000 Indian camp followers uh, marching off to war on 30,000 camels. One brigadier needs 50 camels to carry his kit. Uh, the ranking British general needs 260. There are 30 camels reserved for the regimental wine cellar, and there are seven camels that carry only cigars and cheroots. One regiment brings their own pack of foxhounds. And the man who runs this is a complete idiot. His name is McNaughton. Paul McNaughton should never have left the secretary's office, writes one of his deputies. He is ignorant of men, even to simplicity, and utterly incapable of forming and guiding administrative measures. The judicial line would probably have suited him best, and even then only in the court of appeal, judging only written evidence. So he's not much use. Uh, sounds familiar again, yeah. 
And so they are, off they go, and they go off. Here we have the army, all these soldiers heading off, and they've absolutely no idea where they're going. Uh, they're going off into the Kojak Pass, up through the sort of back of the Bolan, but there's no maps, and there's pictures of these guys just streaming over the mountains, vaguely hoping that Afghanistan will be the far side. They're wearing completely the wrong kit. The British sepoys are sent off in thick winter uniforms, meant to keep them from getting uh, cold in the, in the, in the, in the middle, middle of the UP uh, winter. Uh, but it's the height of summer because they're delayed, and they all die of heat stroke. They don't know where the wells are. A quarter of the army dies without a single shot being fired. Uh, and um, there's lots of Baluchi um, uh, brigands, Ahmed's old mates, shoot sniping from, uh, uh, sniping from the uh, hills. And um, such, having managed to mismanage this war, nevertheless, such is the surprise when this enormous army comes out the back end of the Bolan Pass that the, uh, the warlords, uh, the family ruling the, the, the uh, Dost Muhammad's half-brothers, um, the Barakzai rulers of Kandahar flee without a shot being fired, and Dost Muhammad is able to go to his... Um, grandfather's mausoleum, which you can see in the top left of the picture, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, get the barakat of his grandfather's uh, blessing in the tomb. Uh, and, um, whoops, sorry, I should be going back. Uh, now, British intelligence in the 1830s is every bit as wonderful as it is in, in 2012, and tells the, uh, the army that there are no fortifications in Ghazni. So they leave the cannon behind in, in Kandahar. Uh, and march off, only to find that there are a few fortifications in Ghazni. <laughs> in fact, rather good ones. Uh, but they've got the wind up by this point, and they just blow down the front door, march in, and massacre everyone in there, and they only lose 10 soldiers. And so it is that within a year of setting off from Ferozpur, having despite lost so many of their soldiers from heat stroke and thirst, they get into the Balahisar, and they replace Shah Shuja on the throne with hardly any losses, and it's a major coup. Again, rather like 2012, uh, no, sorry, 2012, 2003, uh, the, the, you, Afghanistan, against all advice, Afghanistan has been taken very easily with barely a, 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 a shot being fired. And immediately the British begin, um, they think that it, it's such an easy conquest that the seeds of their future destruction are sowed immediately when they rather than building some enormous fortification and arming themselves with cannon and, and, and bunk, hunkering down for the Afghan winter, they merely lay out their tents, as you can see in the slide, in the plain, overlooked from all sides by small hillocks. And in due course, some of the tents are replaced by barrack blocks, and there's a small wooden perimeter fence with a ditch put around it. But it is almost completely indefensible. Fantastically, idiotically stupid. Um, and uh, so um, smug are they about their chances. All the Memsabs are brought up from Simla. There's talk about moving the summer capital of the Raj from Simla to Kabul, like Shah Jahan, to, you know, who would move either to Kashmir or to Afghanistan uh, for the summer months. Uh, the, the British think they're going to do the same. And uh, the Memsabs arrive. Lady Sale, who's one of my great heroes in the book, uh, uh, who's much the most masculine uh, Brit uh, in the story. Lady Sale comes with her daughter, uh, her grand piano, and her seeds from her agra garden. And by the following spring, she's writing, my sweet peas and geraniums were much admired. Uh, and in the gut kitchen garden, the potatoes especially thrive. There is horse racing and cricket and open-air amateur theatricals, and as winter draws in, snipe and duck shooting, skating and snowman building. The foxhounds are taken out for, for um, hunting jackals. Burns throws a Christmas party with Scottish reels and bagpipes and presides over it all in Highland dress, complete with a kilt and an enormous sporran. Uh, so they're having a lovely time, and uh, they think that they can do whatever they like. And they begin to reform, again, sounds familiar. What the first thing they want to do is to make an Afghan national army so that they can keep Shah Shuja in, uh, in power. Shah Shuja uh, is, I should just quickly say at this point, a, a Popolzai. In other words, he's actually from the same tiny sub-tribe as President Karzai. Uh, just to <laughs> complete the sense of deja vu about this whole thing. Um, and... Um, 
so President, not President Karzai, Charles Shuja, uh, is, is, uh, one gets muddled sometimes. Um, um, Charles Shuja needs a new army, and so they start taking away land and estates from the old nobility, and this is a mistake because it pisses off the old nobility, who are up to this point happy enough to have their old king back as long as the British go home quickly enough. And had, again, another parallel with the present war, had the British merely gone in, installed their, their, uh, their puppet ruler, started to create a, a, an army to keep him in power, and got out, it's possible that they would have been able to pull this one off. Instead, they stay around. The Afghans begin to think that because by the time the Memsabs have arrived, that it's a, an occupation which is going to stay. And then they begin to take over Shah Shuja's power. So it's quite clearly them ruling rather than Shah Shuja. And that very difficult balance which President Karzai has had to keep between being his own man and being a loyal ally to the people that put him in power is played out again in the following, two, uh, following months. But the biggest mistake that they make is they get all overexcited about the Afghan women. <laughs> now, far be for me to comment on the pleasures and the, and, and the delights of the women of this part of the world, but um, Shah Shuja's back, here's his family, here is Emir Dost Mohammed uh, surrendering himself, but the British begin to turn Kabul into a brothel. There are 38,000 single men in a cantonment, uh, and very, very soon there is a traffic in women in Burqa being taken from the bazaar into the cantonment and coming back a little richer in the morning. And this outrages everyone's idea of honor. And combined with the fact that it looks as if the British are hunkering down for a long occupation, that they're taking the estates from the nobles and they're taking the powers away from the legitimate monarch, means that resistance soon gathers. And the final straw is when Alexander Burns, he of the kilt and the sporran, sleeps with the girlfriend of the leading noble at Shah Shuja's, young noble at Shah Shuja's court, Abdullah Khan Achakzai. This is a mistake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it happened by God's will that a slave girl of Abdullah Khan Achakzai ran away from his house. Now this is the account of Mirza Atta Muhammad. One of the great joys of researching this book was discovering that there were, well, probably many more, but I discovered nine full-length Afghan accounts of this war, which had never been used before in English, used by Afghan historians in Dari, but previously never made the language jump uh, from Dari into English. And this is one of the best ones, Mirza Atta Muhammad's Nawe Ma'arak, the, the, the Song of Battles. It happened by God's will that a slave girl of Abdullah Khan, Achaksai, ran away from the house, his house to the residence of Alexander Burns. When on inquiry, it was found that that was where she had gone, the Khan, beside himself with fury, sent his attendant to fetch the silly girl back. But the Scotsman, swollen with pride, cursing and swearing, had the Khan's attendant severely beaten and thrown out of the house. The Khan then summoned the other Sadars and said, Now we are justified in throwing off the English yoke. They stretched the hand of tyranny to dishonor private citizens, great and small. Making love to a slave girl isn't worth the ritual bath that followed it. Good masculine Afghan stuff, good misogynistic uh, stuff, but here we go. But we have to put a stop to it right here, right now, otherwise, and then this is my favorite sentence in the whole book, otherwise these English will ride the donkey of their desires into the field of stupidity. <laughs> to the point of having us all arrested and deported into foreign imprisonment. I put my trust in God and raise the battle standard of our prophet Muhammad and thus go to fight. If success rewards us, then it is as we wished. If we die in battle, then it is still better than to live with degradation and dishonor. The other noblemen, his childhood friends, tightened their belts and girt their loins and prepared for jihad. So first up for the chop is Alexander Burns. Alexander Burns uh, is, according to Mirza Atta Muhammad, almost certainly not true, but he says that he's enjoying a bath with two Mem Saabs and, the, and Abdullah Khan Achaksai's mistress, uh, um, soaking himself down in the talk of, uh, talk of pleasure and the towels of, of enjoyment. I can't remember the exact phrase. But anyway, he's having a nice time inside. When Abdullah Khan Achaksai and his men turn, out, uh, uh, turn up at the gate, they kill his sepoys. He tries to get out the back door in... Afghan dress, but he's cut down and killed. Henry McNaughton, the guy who should have stayed in the, in the secretary's office, 
goes out to negotiate and he's shot dead by the negotiating team. <laughs> <laughs> Afghans don't mess around on these occasions. Uh, <laughs> Um, they haul the British cannon up onto the hills around the cantonment. You can see the barrack blocks at the bottom there, uh, and they just begin shelling the cantonments. The British general in charge, Sir William Elphinstone, uh, has is got his job only because he has the best grouse moors in Scotland, and the Governor General wants to shoot on them. And um, he's also got a very good whiskey still. Uh, but he is, by the stage that the, out, the, right, the uprising breaks out, he is... Um, so eaten up with gout that he can't even get onto his horse. Eventually he gets onto the horse, the horse, he falls off the horse the other side, the horse falls on him and that's the end of him. So <laughs> <laughs> then, one of the, if they hadn't been stupid enough to put their cantonment on the valley floor and not defended it, even more stupidly, they put their stores, their ammunition and all the food they've got for the winter in two outlying forts undefended except for a small party of six sepoys each, uh, between the town and the cantonment. The Afghans capture these in the first three days. So by the end of the first week, the British are down to eating their foxhounds, uh, <laughs> which is the ultimate humiliation. Uh, then they're down to eating rats. All the time they're being um, shelled by artillery. And by the end of a month, there's absolutely no alternative but for them to surrender. And they, what they managed to extract is a promise of safe passage through the passes, they're going to go to Jalalabad, they're going to then evacuate Jalalabad down the Khyber and out. And they're allowed to bring their small arms, but not their artillery. And that's the best terms they can get. And so off they go, they pack up their palaquins, and into the passes, where this lot, the Gilzai, have absolutely no intention whatsoever of honoring any of the promises made by um, all those guys in Kabul, the Durrani's in Kabul. And... Uh, so it is, on the 6th of January, 1842, it, and heavy, heavy snow, the worst Afghan winter for 30 years, uh, the retreat begins uh, in bright sun, 4,500 troops are left, 700 of them European, the rest of them company sepoys from Bihar and UP, who've never seen snow before, and are, are more or less incapacitated by it and 12,000 camp followers. 18,000 people leave the cantonment on the 6th of January. Um, here is the account of George Lawrence. At 9 a.m. the troops moved off, a crouching, drooping, dispirited army, so different from the smart, light-hearted body of men they appeared some time ago. The men sinking a foot deep with each step in the snow. My heart sunk within me under the conviction that we were a doomed force. Now, among the people on the march was my great-great-uncle, this man, Sir Colin Mackenzie. He wrote a very moving memoir about the retreat. He was one of the few survivors. And he described, I always remembered as one of the most heart-rending sights of that humiliating day, fixing my eyes by chance on a little Hindustani child, perfectly naked, sitting in the snow, with no mother or father near her. She was a beautiful little girl, about two years old, just strong enough to sit upright with her little legs doubled underneath her, her hair curling in waving locks around her soft little throat, and her great black eyes dilated to twice their normal size, fixed on the armed men, the passing cavalry, and all the strange sights that met her gaze. Many other children, as young as innocent, I saw slain on the road, and the women with their long dark hair, wet with their own blood, the rear guard had to fight the whole way to the first night's camping ground at Bagrami and pass through, literally, a continuous line of poor wretches, men, women, and children, dead or dying from the cold and wounds, who, unable to move, entreated their comrades to kill them and put an end to their misery. So again, they make the same mistake they've made already. They lose their stores. The cavalry go out first, followed by the infantry, and the baggage follows last. And of course, the Ghazis and the uh, Jihadis fall on the baggage train and take it. So that the advanced troops, when they've arrived at Bagrami, are waiting for their dinner, they're waiting for the tents, and they don't come. And it gets colder and colder, and there's no food, and there's no cover. Now, the Afghans know exactly what to do, as they do today in the snow. When the, uh, in, in winter warfare, the Mujahideen used to uh, be completely unfazed, had exactly the right techniques for surviving in the winter. But in... Uh, this condition, the Afghans who are with the 
uh, this army, the Jezilchis, who've been employed by the British, dig a circle in the snow, they put a fire in the middle, they light the fire, and then they fan out in a circle with their feet facing the fire, with their cloaks and all their blankets and everything all over them. And they keep themselves warm with their own body heat. It's not a very comfortable night, but it's, uh, they, they're okay. The poor Hindustanis haven't got a clue what to do in the snow. They just lie down on the snow and they wake up and they've got terrible frostbite. Their extremities, their feet and their hands look like charred logs of wood. Uh, and they can't find their muskets and they're completely incapacitated. In the first night, maybe a quarter of the army wakes up with, fr with frostbite. They are then herded like sheep by shepherds by the Afghans at six in the morning into the Kulkabul Pass where the Afghans have prepared the mother of all ambushes. They have realized that the company muskets only fire about 300 yards, but their jezails, which are heavy and clumsy and difficult to load and old-fashioned, their technology 200 years old, the same sort of things you see Shah Jahan shooting deer with in miniatures. But nonetheless, they have a long range and they're accurate. And so they just sit at the top of the hills or halfway up, they build slit trenches and they wait for the British to be herded in and then they open fire. And the first thing the British realize here is this strange metallic ringing noise echoing off the empty snow peaks. A noise so unmistakable in its character that it can never be forgotten by those whose ears have once been startled by the unfamiliar sound. That's the noise of the jezails being loaded. It's the ramrods going down the barrels. The British can't see anything. They can just hear this metallic noise. And then the firing begins. This is Lady Sale's account. She's at the front. The confusion was fearful. We had not proceeded half a mile when we were heavily fired upon. The pony Mrs. Sturt rode was wounded in the ear and the neck. I fortunately had only one ball in my arm. Three others passed through my cloak near the shoulder without doing me injury. The pass completely choked up. And for a considerable period, we were stationary under heavy fire. That night, the sepoys and the camp followers, half frozen, tried to force their way not only into our tents, but into our beds. Many poor wretches died around the tent that night. Many women and children were abducted. My great uncle gets taken hostage at that point, and he has to head back the following day through the, day, previous scenes, the scene of the previous day's ambush. This is his account. We came across many other bloody scenes. Sepoys and camp followers were being stripped and plundered on all sides, and such as refused to give up their money and valuables were instantly stabbed and cut down. On seeing us, the poor creatures cried out for help, many of them recognizing me by name, but what could we do? The gills' eyes had now tasted blood and clearly showed their tigerish nature, becoming very savage and fierce in their demeanor towards us, demanding that we should be given up to them for sacrifice brandishing their long blood-stained knives in our faces and telling us to look upon the heaps of carcasses around us as we should soon be among them. You came to Kabul for fruit, did you? They said, how do you like it now? As we proceeded, we met numbers of the enemy's horse and foot returning to Kabul, laden with plunder on all sides. One miscreant had a little Indian girl seated on the, on the horse behind him. The, sepoy, the British officers are taken hostage. The Sepoys who are captured are, if they are fit, they're taken off to the slave markets. If they are not, if they're frostbitten, they're just stripped of their clothes and driven into the snow. And the Afghans at this period have a very cruel thing with their slaves. They take a horsehair rope and they sew it through the clavicle of the slave and then attach it to the back of the saddle. So that if you don't keep up with your captor, your hands are tied behind your back, you have this rope through under your chest, under your chest bone. And if you don't keep up with your captor, your chest is ripped open. So it's a hideous, hideous thing. But a few of the sepoys somehow managed to escape capture and continue living as cannibals in the caves. First night, it's 18,000 people that leave Kabul. By the first night, there's only 10,000. By the end of the second night, there's only 10,000 that get out of the Kod Kabul Pass. Of those, 6,000 more are frozen to death on the following night up at the top of the peak of the Tezin Pass. When they come down, the Gilzai have prepared a holly hedge blocking the narrowest place in the pass. There is a panic as dusk uh, comes when they hit this. The cavalry trample what's left of the infantry. Only a few, about 200, make it beyond the Jagdalik holly hedge. Akbar Khan, Dost Muhammad's son, is directing the resistance. 
The following morning, the 200 that have made it beyond from the 44th Regiment, 44th Foot, are exposed at dawn on top of the hill at Gundamuk. They fight to their last bullet, they then fight on with bayonets, then they're slaughtered to the last man, except one man, Captain Souter, who's wrapped the regimental flag around him and someone thinks he's useful as a hostage. He's taken hostage, everyone else is killed. Four horsemen make it on to the Nimla Gardens near Jalalabad. There the gardeners invite them to share some, some bread and some mus some, some uh, uh, dahi, and um, as they're eating their breakfast, the gardeners club them to death. One man makes it through to Jalalabad, Dr. Bryden. He only makes it through because he's had wraps up in his hat a copy of Blackwood's magazine, which is the literary journal of its day, published in Edinburgh. And it's a hardback, and they take a swipe at him with the talwa, and it goes through the book, but it doesn't go through the skull. And he limps in. One man of an army makes it back to Jalalabad. Now, obviously, for the British, this is the most terrible tragedy, but for the Afghans, this is the beginning of a, a myth of national resistance, a story of, of nationalism, a story of resistance which echoes today. When you go to Afghanistan today, everyone knows the names of Burns, McNaughton, long forgotten in Britain, are remembered in Afghanistan. And Mirza Atta, who'd originally started as a supporter of Shah Shuja, is thrilled. And within a year, the numbers have started being exaggerated. It is said that 60,000 English troops, half from Bengal, half from other provinces, without counting servants and camp followers, went to Afghanistan. Only a handful came back, wounded and destitute. The rest fell with neither grave nor shroud to cover them, and lay scattered in that land like rotting donkeys. For the English love gold and money so much that they cannot stop themselves from laying their hands on any area productive of wealth. But what prize did they find in Afghanistan? Except on one hand the exhausting of their treasury and on the other the disgracing of their army. It is said that 40,000 English troops have been in Kabul and many were taken captive en route. Others remained as cripples and beggars in Kabul and the rest perished in the mountains like a ship sunk without trace. For it is no easy thing to invade and occupy the kingdom of Horasan. They hoped to establish themselves in Afghanistan to block any Russian advance. But for all the treasure they expended, for all the lives they sacrificed, the only result was ruin and disgrace. And if the English had been able to take and keep Afghanistan, would they have left this land where 44 different types of grape grow and other fruit as well? Apples, pomegranates, pears, rhubarb, mulberries, sweet watermelon and muskmelon, apricots and peaches. Ah, a nice water. Ice water that cannot be found in all the plains of India. For these Indians know neither how to dress nor how to eat. God save me from the fire of their dal and their miserable japatis. <laughs> So that's Mirza Atta signing off on India. But what the British do next is that they send in their best general to lay waste to Afghanistan. The following spring, when the pass is open, the army of retribution appears. Every house in the way is de-roofed, every tree is barked, every field of crops is burnt, every village is destroyed. They come through, they rescue the hostages who are kept in Kabul, Lady Sale uh, leads a sort of jailbreak of the prisoners uh, with a gun in their hands. And then, as a parting gift to Afghanistan, they arrive at the Charchata, the great, greatest bazaar in Central Asia, built by Shah Jahan, the same time as he was building the Taj, and they dynamite it. And out they march in Afghanistan, leaving waste behind them. And that's meant to be their honor saved. I thought I couldn't do this book without going on the route of the retreat. Today, though, at the end of it backs onto um, the um, place where the last stand took place, uh, Gundamuk, this hill, backs onto Tora Bora. Uh, so last that, two last stands in the same place. And uh, it's now Taliban heartland. So, but I had a lucky break. I, Last Mughal had been read by Amrullah Saleh, who was Karzai's security chief. And he sort of hauled me in on my second day in Kabul when I went to research this and sort of gave me a kind of literary critique saying that I had an insufficiently patriotic, that I hadn't done this, I hadn't done that. But I had better do a better job this time. Uh, and um, he then put me in touch with a man called Anwar Khan Jigdalik, who's a former Hezbi Islami commander from Jigdalik. 
whose lands were on the route to the retreat, just five or ten miles, a bit 20 miles from Gandamak. And so we set off out of Kabul, passing the site of the British cantonment of 1839, which inevitably is now the ISAF barracks and the American embassy. Uh, and um, we went up through the Kokobul, up the Tezin Pass in this old pickup. And um, on the way, I said, you know, do you see any parallel between these two wars? He said, it's exactly the same. Both times the foreigners have come here for their own interests, not for ours. They say we are your friends, but they are lying. Whoever comes to Afghanistan, even now, they will face the fate of Burns and McNaughton. This, incidentally, hasn't stopped Anwar Khan Jigdalik from sending off his children to London for a good education. <laughs> but we know all that. Um, so we get to uh, uh, Jigdalik, and there, being Afghans, they lay on the most fantastic feasts for this great hero of theirs. And kebabs are cooked, and, and um, mulberry pulao is presented, and tent flaps of naan is laid out. And this goes on and on and on. As anyone who's been to an Afghan feast will know, it doesn't, the food just keeps on coming. And um, it was about five o'clock in the afternoon. We clearly weren't going to get to Gundamar. We'd just eaten too much, and it was too late, and the day was ending. So we were forced to go back to um, Jalalabad by the, um, by the main road, by Sarobi, and never got to Gundamar. But we arrived in Jalalabad to find that we'd actually had a very lucky save, because that very day, they had sent out the, uh, the police to burn the poppy crop the opium poppies in Gandamak. And nine, they got, villagers had got the, the Taliban in to help them. Nine police vehicles were blown up, 100 people taken hostages, three people killed. So had we turned up with all our guards at five in the afternoon, we almost said, I wouldn't be sitting here chatting you today. Um, but the following day, the elders of Gandamak came in to Jalalabad to negotiate. They had hostages. And so I sat with Anwar Khan watching this jirga as the predator drones took off from the airport in uh, Jalalabad, which is one of the main predator centers, one of the main drone bases, these very sinister looking things. And films, it's always one of them taking off at a time. But in Jalalabad, it's like a kind of London taxi rank. It's these things every, every minute going off. And at the end, we went up to the elders of Gundamak and uh, talked to them. And they said, since the British went, we've had the Russians. We saw them off too, but not before they bombed many of the houses in the village. We are the roof of the world. From here you can control and watch everywhere. Afghanistan is like a crossroads for every nation that comes to power. But we do not have the power to control our own destiny. Our fate is determined by our neighbors. Then one of the, one of the old men said, last month, I'm going to tell you a story. Last month, he said, some American officers called us to a hotel in Jalalabad for a meeting. One of them asked me, why do you hate us? And I replied, because you blow down our doors, enter our houses, you pull our women by the hair, and you kick our children. We cannot accept this. We will fight back, and we will break your teeth. And when your teeth are broken, you will leave, just as the British left before you. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> what did he say to that, I asked. He turned to his friend and said, if the old men are like this, what will the younger ones be like? <laughs> In truth, all the Americans here know their game is over. It's just their politicians who deny it. This is the last days of the Americans, said Jigdalik. Next, it will be China. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wonderful, really wonderful. wonderful. What? Do you want to leave? Well, my, my first question is why this, uh, a lot of your books seem to be about, sorry, um, a lot of your books seem to be about Randy Englishman in uh, running around in India and Afghanistan. I mean, we had the last book, The White Mughals, in which you have East India Company men um, having 12, 14 Indian mistresses um, 300 years ago and fathering a lot of children. This is just my this is just my unpleasant job to chronicle history. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously this is a part of it that you enjoy. You know. Well, yeah, hi history is full of good stories. I mean, I think, as a, to give a serious answer to, to, to the question, I think um, in this part of the world, people have got used to history being very boring. Certainly in India, everyone always tells me that history is the, the subject they like least at school. And it's very boringly taught, and it's dead for them. And what do we people forget, I think, is that you know, history has the word story embedded in it. 
Uh, and I think the narrative of history, the human side, the biographical side of history is so often lost in the history that's written about this part of the world. Um, and people's, people's loves, people's lusts, people's passions are an integral part of, of motivation of, of people's lives, along with the urge to power, along with the urge for riches, along with the, you know, it, it, and I think these things all have to be included. Tell me, what did you, you know, you spent a lot of time in Lahore, um, and, uh, you know, we were together. What did you actually get out of Lahore and, uh, regarding archives and material for this book? Well, first of all, I should say that the idea for this book came sitting in Ahmed's library, looking at his, I don't know if you've been into his magnificent library, but he has one of the best collections of books uh, from the Northwest Frontier, uh, and the, all that. And just spending a day, when I was here doing the Nine Lives um, show at uh, Piru's, um, I spent the day in your library just looking at this, and, and the idea for this book came sitting in your study, so I have a great debt to, uh, to, uh, to thank you for. And um, I can't remember what the question was, but <laughs> what no. the, the archives. So yes, so the main, the most underexploited archive in this part of the world is, I'm sure, this, the state Punjab archives in an Akhali's tomb. Partly because it's quite difficult to get access, and the Jazuddin, who's, who's in the audience somewhere, uh, was very generous in getting me in there, which is not an easy thing to do. And it contains, among other things, it contains the British residency archives, which I used for the last mogul, but it also used, contains the Ludhiana residency uh, archives, which it turned out contained the entire archive of the first British spy master, the M of the origins of the great game, this guy called Sir Claude Wade. And all the things about bribing the tribes, about sending people disguised as carpet sellers to map the passes, all this stuff is sitting here in the hall. Uh, and a lot of the action of the book is set in the hall too. Shah Shuja at one point, when he loses the throne, is um, captured by Ranjit Singh, who takes the Kohinoor from him. And he keeps him hostage in Mubarak Kaveli, that's still there, uh, near Anakali, um, in the old city. Now it's a, it's a Kizilbash uh, house. And um, he then is, manages to burrow out through the Taikana and he gets out, gets through to the Lahore fort where he, he escapes somehow to the Rabi by getting out of the drainage system of the fort. Anyway, he, he escapes out of the city uh, and makes it through to, uh, to the um, Ludhiana where his wife is waiting for him. So it's got a lot of Lahore in it, this book. You know, you've done so much in making come alive the last um, part of uh, uh, the Mughal Empire, um, you know, with two books on, on the Mughals. Um, do, I mean, do you ever feel the need that you need to go back um, to the origins of the Mughal Empire, uh, coming out of Central Asia, conquering Afghanistan, moving into India? I would love to. I mean, what I think, I mean, Jaffa, when he was giving a wonderful presentation yesterday, was talking about how his hybrid identity has always made him interested in hybridity. My identity as, a, as a, a Brit living in this part of the world has always meant that I've been interested in, in the interaction between the British uh, and, and the people of South Asia. And um, all three of these books are part of a trilogy, really. White Moguls opens the story with this period that, of history that's so often forgotten, when the British were terribly interested in Indian culture and Mughal culture and they had Indian wives, they, had, uh, they wore Indian clothes, they liked Urdu poetry, uh, they particularly um, enjoyed mixing with the Mughal nobility, they felt a great deal in common. Uh, they, um, uh, and there was this period when one in three British men in India was married to uh, an, uh, an Indian woman. And, uh, they, and there was a far greater sharing of tastes and interests and intermarriage than has been recorded, but it goes down. And the next book in the trilogy, I suppose, is this one, which is 1840s. And by this stage, the East India Company is the hyperpower. Like America, after the fall of the Soviet Union, it becomes very arrogant. Uh, it's not interested in Indian culture anymore. It wants to preach evangelical Christianity. And it's aggressive enough to get involved in a ridiculous adventure like this. Mm. Then the final part of the trilogy is what happens in 1857, the Great Uprising. And by this point, the British have become so obnoxious and they're so uh, aggressively propagating Christianity that it, this war, which in the documents in Delhi is, is overwhelmingly, the rhetoric of the resistance is religious, whether Hindu or Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's this joint Hindu-Muslim uprising against the Christians, which it means attacks on Indian Christians as well. Very interesting. 
You know, I mean, one thing I, I found in this book is that you're very careful not to try and equate every incident that happened in 1839 to something that happened in 2012, for example. I mean, that would be a very easy thing to do. Oh, well, this happened then, and now this is happening now. But you, you hinted it very subtly. I mean, was, was that a difficult thing to do? So the rule I had was that the main body of the book, there's not a single reference to the presence at all, except in the occasional footnote. Uh, where there's, where, for example, talking about Mubarak Habeli still being there in, in, in modern Lahore and, and, and so on, and, and still having a taikana, incidentally. Um, but the parallels I make only in the introduction and in the afterward. Um, but no, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on, on present-day Afghanistan, and, and, and um, I, I always am aware that my, my knowledge is a 19th century historian and, and that I, I'm not the best person perhaps to talk about the parallels, but the basic outline of the parallels are extraordinary yeah. to the extent that you have a very similar um, an easy conquest, uh, the resistance grows starting in Helmand, working north, eventually you have the Europeans surrounded in the cities with the countryside over to the, uh, to the resistance with the towns occupied by the occupation forces. Uh, you have a lot of arming of, by, after the fall of Ranjit Singh, you have a lot of arming of the resistance f out of Lahore and Rolpindi. Um, you have, again, you have the Sikh Khalsa helping and uh, providing uh, refuge for the rebels against the, uh, against the British, the Durrani rebels. And um, you have um, extraordinary micro-geography similarities. So when I was in Kandahar researching this, um, I took with me a photocopy of Henry Rawlinson's diary, the same guy who spotted Vitkovich, the spy, going into Afghanistan at the beginning of the story. He gets appointed the governor of Kandahar during the, um, during the occupation. And he writes a diary every day in the shrine of Baba Wali, overlooking the Argandab Valley, just near the, the famous compound where uh, Mullah Omar uh, was supposed to have met bin Laden. And I sat there reading Rawlinson's diary one evening, and he's described seeing coming down the hill this group of lancers with their plumed shakos and their scarlet cloaks coming down, crossing the bridge over the Arkandab and then fighting with the Durrani cavalry. And as I was reading this, this huge convoy of American Humvees and those big anti-blast vehicles came down, lumbering down the same road, crossed the bridge over the Arkandab and then about 200 yards into the Arkandab Valley an IED went off, this plume of smoke. Um, and literally on the same side. So you have these, the same towns occupied by people speaking the same language, sniped at from the same uh, hills. And you, you just don't have to point it out. It's so sort of blindingly obvious to the extent that the, 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 the main NATO barracks and the American embassy is on the site of the British cantonment. What, what, you know, what makes very sad reading, but, but what is very interesting is this, is this debate that goes on in the British camp as to do we get out now, do we wait till the spring, you know, we've got these useless generals, what on earth do we do with them? Um, should the younger, younger officers take over? This is something that is going on right now. I didn't know that. Uh, is there still, the younger officers feel their old generals are uh, dodgery and gout ridden? Yeah, and, I, yeah. I, I mean, I think every capital in Europe right now has got this huge debate as to, do we leave troops behind uh, uh, once we pull out in 2014? Or, you know, how many troops do we leave behind? How many bases do we occupy? Should we talk to the Taliban, not talk to the Taliban? These are all debates that are going on right now. What I'd like to um, talk to you about, I mean, is, I mean, when you were writing Pakistan on the Brink, did you feel that the, um, the, the, the Taliban have the power to sweep back? Once the, what's your prospects for Karzai's survival? Well, I, I mean, this book is really about, you know, the need to talk to the Taliban, how both Karzai and the West should talk to the Afghan Taliban, because I think they really are ready for some kind of power-sharing agreement. Uh, and now that, the story of that, of course, is bogged down also in innumerable back and forths and complications and um, all the rest of it. But, you know, and it hasn't been helped by Pakistan's attitude over the last several years uh, in supporting the Afghan Taliban, continuing, helping them continue the war, basically. I think a lot of the Afghan Taliban is, are very tired. Are they, are they sitting in Quetta? I mean, where, where's, where? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> well, most of the leadership is in Pakistan, I think. I think a lot of them are probably sitting in Karachi right now. But a lot of the leadership... Are any, anyone here? Any? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them are in... Um, uh, uh, I think most of them are in Pakistan. 
and, and some of them have been um, picked up, have been put under house arrest by the Pakistani authorities. Others are free to maneuver. And what exactly, um, uh, what is the difference between if you're free to maneuver and free to, uh, or you're in house arrest, um, you know, is, it's, it's almost impossible did to you, say. Did you interview any of the leadership when you were writing this book? Not the leadership, but I interviewed uh, Taliban who had uh, um, um, stopped fighting and had, were either in exile abroad or had come back to Kabul. And uh, they're playing a very, a, a very big role in trying to convince the Americans and the West to, um, you know, talk to the Taliban and make peace. And the big debate that, you know, I talk about is, of course, the debate in Washington. Um, there's, there was this huge rift between the U.S. military and the CIA on one side and the State Department on the other. Uh, the military not wanting to talk to the Taliban, the State Department wanting to talk. And I thought Holbrook was blocking it originally. The no, Hol Holbrook was very much in favor of talks, actually. He died just, you know, too soon. He died almost weeks after the first talk started, unfortunately. The, the British ambassador in, in Kabul who, um, who took me around initially, a guy called Sir Sherrod Cooper Coles, described Holbrook as a bull who brought his own china shop wherever he went. Which <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, certainly he was, a, he was a very controversial figure, but I think... He really wanted to see a peace settlement at the end of the day. He, he imagined, you know, he did the Balkans, he did the Dayton Accords. He wanted to see a kind of Dayton Accords between Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the Taliban. And, and that is his dream. Now, I think it was probably a false dream because if there is going to be peace here, it's not going to be done in some grand meeting. It's going to be done bit by bit by bit with all the various actors coming together and compromising. Uh, as to what, you know, what this presence is. But there's no question that, I mean, there is a tit-for-tat proxy war going on between India and Pakistan over Afghanistan, just as there was over Kashmir, over the Punjab in, in, in uh, India and other places. And do you think it is the fear of India that is the main motivating force that keeps the, the Pakistani army arming the Taliban? No, I, I, I think there's an, there's an absolute fear of what would happen when the Americans leave. There's a real fear about continuing instability in Afghanistan. And there's a real fear of what impact um, uh, the Afghan Taliban are going to have on, on Pakistan and the yes. Pakistani Taliban and whether that will happen. But let me um, really just open up now to some but one questions. Final, final, final question. China. Do you think China can, can exploit Afghanistan? They bought up the mineral rights. There's a railway coming in. China is going to be the economic salvation of Afghanistan in the next five to ten years, without a doubt. It has bought up so much mineral rights, oil rights. It will set up roads and railways directly into China. And frankly, unless Pakistan backs a peace effort um, in Afghanistan and, um, uh, you know, stops the, pushes the Taliban into a peace agreement, that, you know, uh, we'll be left completely on the sidelines, unable to do anything. Because ch the Chinese are the next economic power. They will not send troops. They will not be a military power. Do you see any hope of India and Pakistan settling their differences and, and learning from China's? Because Ch China's already making money out of Pakistan. Well, so is the India. The rare earths and the copper I, and the... Uh, oh. India has invested enormously. They, they've invested in a huge iron ore deposit uh, north of Kabul. They, they want, they're, they're, they've got big oil companies, big mineral companies. They want to invest. And again, I mean, you know, this, uh, the Pakistanis are seeing this with great trepidation. But the point is that, look, th there's enough to go around for everyone. Um, I think Pakistan can play a huge economic role in Afghanistan. It can't do it alone. It will have to partner with China or with India. Why not with both? Thank you very much. So, yeah. um, can I... Are we, are we in a hurry? Can, can I ask the audience? I can't see very much, but... Uh, Turn the lights on. Yeah, let's have the lights on. Um, any questions of Willie? Is there a microphone for this gentleman? Yeah. Not, for, not for us. I can hear you. I'll repeat the question. Here comes. Of the history and the debacles. Say again. And the mistakes and the errors. 
Has Britain ever learned from the history? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And Edmund Burke famously remarked, um, he who does not remember history uh, is destined forever to repeat it. And the weird thing is that the British system through which I sent my kids teaches no imperial history. The children learn the Tudors, they learn about the Nazis, they don't learn a single lesson about the Raj, about the Empire, about the, the good things we did, like, uh, like the incorruptibility of the ICS, the, uh, the ra railways, the bad things we did, the war crimes, the massacres. It's simply not on the syllabus. So the British have forgotten any lessons that they ever learned. It, uh, there was a time when that was not the case, as recently as the 1950s, when uh, Sir Harold Macmillan was handing over to Sir Alec Douglas Hume the keys of Downing Street. The younger man is supposed to have asked, are there any, uh, are there any, uh, any bit of advice you'd like to offer me, sir, as I take up office? And uh, Macmillan said, well, my dear boy, as long as we don't invade Afghanistan, we should be fine. <laughs> uh, sir, just one thing I would like to ask you. Why did the British go via Balochistan? Why didn't they go via Khyber? This was because of um, Ranjit Singh, who very sensibly didn't want the British taking an army through the Punjab. And there's accounts by an independent British observer called Charles Hassan, who's a fantastic character, who's a numismatist, an archaeologist, and latterly a spy, um, and what a, I, worth a biography in himself. Uh, Masson follows in the wake of the route of the Indus, uh, the army of the Indus, and describes complete devastation left by this enormous army as everywhere they passed. And Ranjit Singh closes the Punjab, so they have to go down to the Indus. They, get a, uh, they go up the course of the Indus from, um, uh, from Shikapur, uh, through what's, uh, what's the very beginnings of Quetta, just a village in those days, um, and uh, into, the, into the Bolan and Kojak passes where the railway runs today. When you, when you take the railway from uh, Quetta to Lahore, that goes through the, the Bolan. But the Sikhs owned the Shah, didn't they? So a big part of the story, which we haven't talked about, is that uh, Ranjit Singh starts the whole thing ball rolling when in 1837 he captures Peshawar. And he does it in agreement with Shah Shuja. Shah Shuja's earlier attempts, has a number of other early attempts to capture, recapture his kingdom. The 1837, it's 1834. 1834, Shuja leads an army up the Bolan and Kojak, one route to attack Kandahar, and it's agreed that Ranjit Singh will attack Peshawar at the same time. And while Shuja fails in his attempt to get Kandahar, there is a successful conquest of Peshawar by the Sikhs, which is why the British then have Peshawar and why you guys now have it today. It's all because of uh, uh, Ranjit Singh taking it in 1834. Uh, and it was the summer capital of Afghanistan. It wasn't con ever considered part of Hindustan. Uh, it was always considered the, the summer capital of Durrani, Afghanistan. And today in Afghanistan, there is a strong belief among army officers who I talk to that you support the Taliban today because you don't want Afghanistan to be strong, so Afghanistan can't take back Peshawar. I got told that frequently. It seems, to be a, it seems to be a very strong belief in Afghanistan. This is your motive for arming the Taliban. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Right. Hello. Hello. Hi. Sir, I would last, I'd like to ask you a question on David Cameron's recent visit to India. He refused to apologize. Put the microphone closer to your mouth. He refused to apologize for the Jallianwala Bagh incident, and he refused to return the Kohinoor to back to India. Do you think this is pure political, this is British arrogance all over again, or do you think it's a political statement? If you were David Cameron's advisor, what would you tell him to do? <laughs> Definitely needs a drink after that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would, be better I'm sorry, I can't give you anything stronger. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's only water, will you? No, I would have liked a glass of whiskey. But anyway, he needs must. Um, no, I think that it would have been the height of bad taste for Cameron leading a trade mission full of British Aerospace and Rolls-Royce seeking investment opportunities for British industry to have made an apology uh, while coming with the trade delegation. It would have looked at the most cynical and least heartfelt apology imaginable and it would have just been, uh, the Indians would have treated it with proper derision. My personal belief is that there is every reason to apologize for things you've done, but it's almost meaningless to apologize for things that happened before you were born. So I think you can, Tony Blair could apologize for Iraq, 
and should have apologised for Iraq, but it would have been bonkers, it was bonkers for him to apologise for the Irish potato famine. Um, one thing he had control over was his mistake and he should have apologised for, the other he had no control over. What the British should do though, as I said just a minute ago, is they need to learn about their own imperial history, which they've forgotten. And most Brits have no concept of either the good or the bad, and certainly not the war crimes. There is a, a, an image in England that the Raj was this lovely benign thing, uh, quite, uh, that sort of virtually no one was killed, it just involved a lot of elephants and sort of uh, viceroys in howders and uh, waving benignly at the crowd. <laughs> And lots of their bars, um, and uh, and you know, and, and then and then it was Gandhi, and that was it. Um, and we all left as friends, and we gave you Lady Mountbatten as a present. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, in, in 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 fact, when the first British soldiers um, were the British fought in the second and third Afghan wars, were in in Kandahar and Helmand in, in those areas, and they all were very impelled. The, uh, the Afghans are dying to see us come back mm. and to lead the new troops. I said, look, I'm sorry. The Afghans have got terrible memories of you, and they, you know, they're not going to help you. They're going to fight you. Uh, don't for a moment think that somehow, because you've got this tradition and you've been in Afghanistan, that everybody's going to love you. Nobody's going to love you. And particularly um, you, you, this idea that Cameron has that India and Britain have a special relationship. It's a very nice romantic idea, but India doesn't feel that. Yeah. They, they're kowtowing to America. Uh, and they want to be America's friend. They, and I think there's, fun enough, there's an exaggerated sense of British decline in India. The Indians believe that they are already a superpower and that Britain is already a completely impotent, uh, impotent and finished power. In reality, I think, you know, I just stick up for my nation just for a change here. For a bit. <laughs> Britain is still, you know, the fifth economy in the world. Uh, it still has major centers of learning. Uh, it has uh, an incredible press and, and, and uh, London is one of the great towns of the world. It still is a world power, there's a, a United Nations seat and it, is, it has some influence in the world. Uh, but the, uh, and, and India, for all its economic power, ha there's many question marks about the, 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 the future, no, the future in general. I mean, I think you know, it's not a done deal, um, the, 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 the kind of bright shining future for the Indian economy. It, it may well happen, but there's many, there's many things that can go wrong and there's all sorts of instabilities. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think the, but, the, but it, it is primarily a, uh, this, this illusion that the British have, that uh, everyone loves us. <laughs> Who, um, so Who else? I, um, Who's got the mic? I, uh, so thank you so, uh, so much for your brilliant presentation. I have a question. So reading through your books, um, you talk about how during the 1840s and 50s, you have these Christian missionaries coming to India and with the very stringent view of what it means to be Christian, and you cannot mix Hinduism with that. Now, uh, India, on the other hand, or South Asia, had a more synchristic tradition, remnants of which are still you know, visible. So my question is that, is, is this religious fundamentalism, this, this sort of compartmentalization of religion, is, is a direct result of these Christian missionaries coming during the 50s, 1850s and 1860s? Very interesting question. Um, I think there's, there's fashions in religion as there are fashions in, in, in dresses or hairstyles. And you see periods of religious tolerance turning into periods of religious orthodoxy. And this happens in the pre-colonial period, the way that uh, you have the period of, of Akbar and, uh, and Jahangir turning into the greater orthodoxy of Shah Jahan, which turns into the pure orthodoxy and Puritanism of Aurangzeb. In the same way, um, you have in Britain the, the period of, uh, of, the, of the Stuarts, uh, passing into the Puritanism of, of Cromwell. And um, I think South Asia goes through these, these, these different phases. And there's a, uh, the Georgian England of the 18th century has a similar sort of syncretic feeling uh, and an attitude that there are many names for gods, that all the different gods are one. You have this expressed by poets such as Pope, uh, which is very similar to the sort of mystical poetry that you might get um, in any of the Suf Sufi shrines, in Baba Farid or um, uh, uh, Bule Shah or, or that, that's it. so you, you get that echoed in Western poetry as well, but it goes by the mid-19th century, it's hardline evangelical uh, uh, attitudes, um, and, and these things come and go. I have a question. Where do you see Pakistanis heading? And this is one for, this is one for Ahmed rather than me, I think. <laughs> Ahmed? They've heard, they've heard <laughs> you go ahead. Hey, where do I see Pakistan going? Well, I think there's a big question mark, as you, as you all know. Um, it's, this is a very, very, I mean, the title of Ahmed's book is Pakistan on the Brink. Um, and um, 
I, I don't know whether any of you read, and if you haven't, you should read Mohsen Hamid's wonderful op-ed in the New York Times two days ago. And he says a lot of the trouble in this part of the world has come from the Pakistani valorization of the militant. What Pakistan and India both need now is peace, more than anything, the peace to get on and develop and, and, and turn, turn the attention on, on alleviating the poverty of the poor and so on. And if I, I pray with all my heart that we can have a peace deal of some sort and some sort of rolling back of relations between India and Pakistan. Because if you can divert funds from the military to, uh, to development, uh, both sides are the winners. Uh, excuse me. And uh, I really do think we have to address the issue of extremism. Uh, 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 Mohsen's piece was wonderful, but again, you know, I, um, I just come back from India where the main issue is Mumbai and the attack on Mumbai by Lashkar Taiba and the fact that we are holding people who took part in that attack but we're not putting them on trial and nothing is happening. So there's an extreme frustration in India um, about that. So I think, you know, this whole, um, um, unfortunately the genie that we released or Zia al Haq released uh, back 30 years ago um, uh, in the country has to be put back into the bottle and it can only be done so when civil and military and um, all the political forces work together. And that's something that's not happening. Are we finished? Have we got time for uh, one more? Lucy? Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you. Huh? Okay, let, let, let's make this the last question. One last question. Okay. He didn't ask his question yet. Yeah, sure. He didn't ask the question yet. No, he didn't. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your uh, brilliant performance, sir. Uh, I want to ask a personal question from you, sir, uh, to William de Limpel, sir, that how did you fuse with the Indian culture and Indian, you know, uh, while reading your books uh, from uh, City of Jinn to Edge of Kali, Last Mughal? It's, uh, it seems a miracle for me to how can you go that far? I have read uh, so many things in Indian history by the natives, but I could not find that immersion you had gone through, sir. So I would like to listen to your comment about that, sir. Well, I'm just a classic immigrant. I've, <laughs> I just, I've been here 30 years now, um, and um, I've always based myself in Delhi. I come here a lot. Um, and um, it's just, it, I found this is the part of the world that suits me on a whole variety of ways. I, I, I love living here. Um, I find that my interests as my interests evolved, it's accommodated in this part of the world from my early days as a journalist and a travel writer to, to becoming a historian, now more interested perhaps in art history. Uh, and wherever my interests take me, I find the material and uh, just so rich on the ground between, uh, between this country and India and, and Nepal and Sri Lanka and Afghanistan. This whole region is just so rich in stories. And, uh, uh, and, it's just, and I think if you're lucky enough to do what you love for your living, um, that, uh, that hard work never seems like hard work, that uh, you can be getting up uh, early and working very late and it's still pleasurable. Um, can I just end by saying uh, that this has been an incredible festival. Yeah. It has been um, a, an effort, an effort, by, an effort initially by two people, Razi and Nusrat Jamil, for doing this. I hope this has put Lahore onto the map. And we have here the founder of the festivals of South Asia, uh, the founder of the Jaipur Festival which was first uh, emulated by Karachi um, for two years and now by Lahore. Lahore has always been the cultural and political center of the subcontinent right through the uh, Mughal days to, to the British days. I hope once again the efforts of Nusi and Razi and all the other workers who've been involved, the volunteers, the students, all of them will, will, will benefit from what has happened. I just want to thank every Lahori who has come.
this one. Can it's really yeah. about every single person who has come and made it possible. And the lesson I have learned in three days is that we can do it. Yes, Ben Ahmed, we can, we can have the kite festival, we can have the literary festival, we can do pretty much every damn thing we want. If, if we want to get our act together, we need to get out, we need to be together, and we can do it. That is the only lesson I have learned. And thank you so much for coming out. You cannot imagine how grateful I am personally, because this was such a major event for us, and I think Lahori's have proved it, that they stand together and they take ownership of what they do. Thank you very much. We'd like to thank Dawn Media Group for the media partnership we had with the LLF. We'd like to thank Latitude and Umar Jamil for the great PR work they did with the LLF. And many corporations and foundations and individuals from Lahore and elsewhere in Pakistan that made this such a great success. And we look forward to welcoming you all in 2014.